And now, with sound investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, we are back in the saddle again. The, uh, the three amigos are going to do a little work here to uh, educate uh, willing students, we hope. As a matter of fact, I got to tell you, all three of us, we really appreciate the feedback that we've gotten from you about the help that we have been. And we do appreciate the questions. We're going to answer some of those today. Uh, not as many as we would like, but but we don't give short answers here, folks. <laughs> we, we make them long, so we'll uh, maybe we'll shorten them up a little bit today. But I I've got a uh, couple of things. I just got done. Oh, by the way, for newcomers, uh, Daryl Balls is uh, the the fellow with a grayer beard than I have and the longer hair, yeah. and. Uh, <laughs> And More Chris Patterson, uh, Daryl is the one who who puts most of the tables that you'll see on our website uh, come from Daryl's work. Chris does some of those. Uh, Daryl is our director of analytics, and Chris Patterson is our director of research. And so uh, I'm 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 thrilled to have them here with me. We just talked for 15 or 20 minutes before we got started here, and. Boy, there's a lot of stuff we'd like to talk about, but I want to start with what I, the can I opened last week when I took a look at how Chris Patterson's recommended exchange traded funds, those are the best in class exchange traded funds. We were talking about how he felt about the the, the grade that he likely got. I guess I would have given him a, uh, an A plus, but uh, Chris, uh, uh, tell us how you responded uh, when when you looked at the outcome of all of that work that you put into selecting those ETFs. Well, I knew that you were going to do something looking back at 2021. I just didn't realize it was going to be my performance review. <laughs> so <laughs> I, when I was listening to the podcast, I was listening with bated breath, waiting to see, did I do good or bad? Uh, it, You know... Um, there were two things, I guess, that stuck with me. Uh, one was that it was it was nice that we did okay. You know, that it didn't seem like uh, on balance that the overall set of recommendations were way out of line. Yeah, you know, we, we work very, very hard trying to make sure that, like a doctor, we do no damage, right? We do no harm, that we want to be very prudent in our recommendations. And it seems like they were good recommendations for the year. Uh, the recommendations though are really designed to work over much longer than a year so if it was a good year that's great hopefully it gives people added confidence to stick with them but uh it wouldn't be surprising given the kind of portfolios that we recommend that they do poorly for a year two years five years even um but it was good to see that they did pretty well and then um the other part uh is that I, I kept thinking as you uh, kept kind of ascribing the recommendations to me that it's important people know that I don't sit here uh, formulating an opinion and exercising a lot of judgment. To a large extent, the funds choose themselves. It's a very uh, systematic process that I use to decide what's going to be recommended. And it has everything to do with whether they give us the exposure to the small and to the value parts of the market cost effectively so that we can expect good returns and that they do that consistently over time. And uh, so although you gave me credit for the, the picks, uh, to a large extent, the funds kind of pick themselves. Now, I do have to, I have to ask, when you say expect one, two, three, four, five years of underperformance, explain why we should expect underperformance. Well, the, um, the expectation wouldn't be that the funds underperform their asset class necessarily, but uh, it would not be surprising, for example, for the big Vanguard VBR fund to do better in years where large and growth beat small and value. 
Uh, and so it wouldn't be surprising to go several years where a fund that doesn't align with the strategy or doesn't give us as, as much long-term exposure to those growth factors did better. And that, that kind of thing switches around with uh, the uh, shifts in the business cycle and the economy, periods of inflation, periods of low inflation, periods of growth versus pullback versus all of that plays into which funds are going to do well at any moment in time. And I'm not trying to pick the funds that are going to shine just for a year. Uh, if I did that, we would need to update them every year and we don't feel a need to update them every year. Our typical cadence is every couple of years. As, as you know, and a lot of your listeners know, I'm planning to do an update this year just because there have been so many new funds that came out. Uh, but um, it, it would the biggest reason that you might lag or see your perf, your portfolio underperforming what you were hoping for uh, is long long trends in the business cycle that don't favor the kind of factors that the portfolios are built to give exposure to. And that's that's the price investors pay. If you want a different return, you have to tolerate a, a different ride. And sometimes that difference lasts a very long time. On the other hand, just to, to be fair to the attempt not only to select the, the best equity asset classes, that's where the, the growth is going to be, we also have worked hard to put together portfolios that are balanced. I'm thinking, the, for example, the four fund strategies that are a combination of large and small and value, maybe even US and international, uh, that should smooth the curve. We may be underperforming in one arena. Last year, that would have been internationals, partly because we had a strong dollar. Uh, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and another year, it's going to be because value is out of favor. So uh, our hope is, is that when we go through those periods, that some asset classes perform poorly, that there's going to be something else going on that's going to give you a chance to, uh, to, to, to perform uh, and meet your, your needs. That's what most of us are trying to do is to meet our needs, not our neighbors, but, but our needs. And that's, uh, that's what we're trying to help build portfolios around. So you're working on the new update. And Daryl, out of curiosity, what are you working on here first part of the year? Well, like you mentioned, all the tables that, that we put out on the website. So the first couple of months, two, three months of the year is spent updating those hundred and some odd tables uh, for the ultimate buy and hold and a lot of the other uh, special portfolios that we look at, the four funds, the all values. Uh, so the, we'll be doing that and uh, updating some of the special studies like your no nonsense funds uh, study and the uh, quilt charts. We'll be looking at, at updating the quilt charts again for the last couple of years, haven't done that for a few years. So that'll be what's going to occupy me for the first few months here. That's great. And I have got a presentation coming up for the White Coat Investor Conference, where we're going to talk about the 150 portfolios better than yours. That is an article that they've had on their website for years. It's actually not 150. It's over 200 now. And a lot of our portfolios are in that mix. Uh, but what we're going to do and then in a couple of months after that or sooner, I'll do the same thing for all of our, our listeners and viewers. We're going to figure out what is it uh, that made the best of those 150 to 200 uh, uh, portfolios? Is there anything to learn? And thanks to all the hard work from Daryl, we're going to have more tables that we can look at and see what were the factors, what was the energy that made some strategies better than others for the long term. And then the question always is, is there evidence that that should continue? And so we'll do all we can to, to answer, answer those questions. So if, uh, if you guys don't have anything else in mind right now, I'm gonna take a question from our viewers and listeners. Sounds good, let's go. Okay, uh, so we, we get this kind of question often. 
and and uh, and I'm sorry that they expect you to answer all of these, uh, uh, Chris. But uh, Aaron writes, and he wants to know he's got within his 401k plan access to the Vanguard Small Cap Index Fund, very low expense ratio, four one hundredths of one percent, and he's got the Goldman Sachs Small Cap Value very expensive, actively managed managed fund. And the question that he has, and Daryl, I think you're going to probably at some point weigh in on this as well, but which one of those would you recommend that, that he use in that portfolio? So uh, this is a uh... GSSIX versus VSCIX. Were those that's the tickers the two, on that? That's right. Those are the tickers. Yeah. Well, in taking a look back, um, you know, the, the small cap value, I usually figure, practically speaking, you're hoping to get an extra couple of percent out of a, a small cap value fund that's low cost. If you have to give one of those percent back, your your expected return is going to be pretty close to the same as a small cap blend fund probably because you know you're trying to get an extra percent for small and an extra percent for value and then if you have to give a percent back for the management fee maybe they show some skill that they're charging for but then they charge for it um it sounds to me like it's going to be a bit of a horse race and when we looked back at the past performance um we, we did a quick look uh, going back to 1997. And across all of those years, the Goldman Sachs did 9.74% and the Vanguard small cap index did 9.38. So they're pretty darn close to one another. And there were points along the way where one's ahead and the other the others ahead. So I think the first question I would ask him is or her i don't know whether it was a, a man or a woman but i would say you know do you have access to a low cost small cap value fund in a brokerage account or do you have another ira where maybe you could hold that part of your portfolio just just there's a good chance you're going to get a, another percent back for getting that cost down and getting rid of the expensive active management so that that would be my instinctive reply, but uh, I know you and Daryl both looked at it too. So what do you guys think? What you you went well, back to 1970, I think, Daryl. I did. I looked at at uh, the return sequences we have for the index that represent those those asset classes, and over that 52 years period, roughly, the uh, the small cap value index, U.S. small cap value index, did about two. A little more than two or two percent better per year in terms of compound annual growth rate than the small cap uh, small cap uh, blend index. The uh, the other thing is that I remember uh, when we talked about this earlier, Paul. You said that the the small in the small value fund was smaller than the small in the small blend fund, and so about half the size companies, yeah, six so billion that, versus about three. So that, that should help boost the return for the more expensive small value fund also in addition when compared to the small small blend fund. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's kind of a, you have to be careful when you, when you compare indexes because they're, they're a, a different beast from a real fund. So uh, the kind of results that Chris talked about is, is not something that would surprise me. Um, even even though you might expect that the compound returns might be a little higher and should offset that that uh, higher expense ratio, it appears in the real world that that doesn't necessarily happen. And no, part just... of what I've found is the harder you try uh, to get a return, you know, the more factors you try to employ, the less efficient the fund is at getting access to uh -oh. those attributes of the stock market. So. A, uh, a small blend fund probably has a chance to be a little bit more efficient than a small value fund, um, than a small value quality fund, than a small value quality momentum. Fund. You know, I mean, the more the more you're reaching, it seems like uh, the more likely you are to incur costs, trading costs and various other things that kind of erode the theoretical return that you're trying to go get. 
Well, here's what the academics uh, said recently at DFA, and that is that going back to 1928, the value premium, they didn't talk large or small, the value premium is about four and a half percent a year over growth. Now, we are often looking at the S&P 500 instead of a growth fund. So that already has changed the mix from being the less productive growth to the combination of growth and value. But that at least is the history according uh, to the folks at, uh, at, at DFA. I think it's also very interesting to look at what happens to actively managed funds versus the index. I just today was looking at the SPIVA report that's put out by uh, Standard & Poor's uh, looking back over 20 years through the end of June of 2021. And when you look at the difference in return from the index to the average mutual fund, it's normally about a 2% difference over that 20 years. That's a lot. And so the closer you can be to looking like an index, and looking like the expenses of an index, which is zero basically. Although Daryl, you you build you build some some expenses into those tables that you produce. So I think that's a fair thing to do. But not only is there that two percent difference, but somebody's going to end up in the first quartile, somebody in the second, somebody in the third, somebody's going to be in that bottom quartile. And by the time you end up in that bottom quartile, uh, and, and smart people end up in the bottom quartile, it can be a 4% a year difference in return. So there's a part of me that says, when things are close between an actively managed fund and, a, and another fund that's an index fund, I might give an edge to the index only because it is the most predictable return. Who knows how that manager uh, at that small cap value fund that's actively managed, who knows how they will do? For example, if I might mention this, in the case of, of that fund, that that the index fund, I think they have about 1,500 companies. In the case of the small cap value, it's about 275, if I recall. So there's a big difference in terms of diversification. So maybe it's just there's a lot of luck in this process, but it seems like people who end up in the index funds get luckier, if that's the way we can call it. Well, if I can just add to that, I, I think uh, along with the luck goes, uh, you know, what do you put your faith in? Nope. And uh, if, if you have faith in the market and you have faith in a segment of the market doing something for you over time, uh, that's unlikely to change. You know, you probably learned that through academics or studying the history of returns. Uh, if you have faith in an advisor, it's easy to second guess that. Because maybe he was really good for two years because he got lucky and now he's unlucky and I should trade out. And there's evidence that people who invest in active funds are far less likely to stick with them and get the return of the fund, um, that they're more likely to jump ship in bad times and to, to do poorer than the fund does. And so um, I think that just adds to what you just said, you know, that the the investor is likely to be a little bit safer if they're following something that's more systematic and easier to understand. Another question, a long question. I'm not going to make it long, at least not the question, but it was a long question. But what it really boiled down to was John, uh, a man and his wife who have plenty of money for retirement. They don't need this inherited IRA that they got. And so he was concerned about the asset allocation that should be used for this $212,000 uh, uh, inherited IRA. And so uh, you can imagine the kind of things I was interested in, in terms of what to do with that as an investment. What have you, what, what would you have asked? Uh, Daryl, got an idea what you would ask John before he put that money to work? 
Well, um, if they if their retirement is secure without this, then I think one of the things, and I think you mentioned this when we talked earlier, is that you could almost consider this as the foundation for a generational kind of uh, family legacy. And if that's if that's what you want to do, then there are a couple of things that that are different that that feed into the play here. Your time horizon is 60 years, not 10 years or 20 years. Um, so you need to think about asset allocation in terms of that kind of a time horizon, not short-term time horizon. It's not about your remaining life, it's about the family legacy. That's the first thing to think about. The second thing to think about, if I remember correctly, he was concerned about how, since it's an inherited IRA, and now you have to take it out. You have to, to, to empty that IRA within 10 years. And so uh, that's how, how's the best way to go about doing that? Well, it, it kind of boils down to a tax question and we are not tax advisors. I certainly am not. But, but the way I would think about this, if this is a familial legacy, uh, kind of a, a pile of, of money, it's, it's not really you that's paying the taxes, it's the family legacy that's paying the taxes. So you could take them out of the fund itself. You pay the taxes with the proceeds from the distribution from the IRA. Um, having said that, uh, I think you can be, you can make those distributions intelligently. Um, one way to do it is you can wait and take it all out at the end of year 10. You can take it all out now or you can take it out all at some intermediate year or over a period of time. So he was about to hire an advisor to pay 1%. And the reason he wanted an advisor was to help him with this decision uh, regarding the taxes. And, uh, and I did suggest to him that uh, it would probably be a lot less expensive to just get that tax advice from somebody who is a tax advisor Agreed. Agreed. And, and not tie it to how much money you have under management. The one thing I did recommend to him, um, because I used to work with clients and, and su suggest, suggest this, and it was normally accepted, and that is to maintain that body of money. I mean, here, like, like you said, Daryl, this is a family thing here, potentially, and and somebody left something somebody hopefully they loved left something and if you can leave that money intact so that whatever you do with it you take it out to go on a trip you take it out to do something good for the family you you remember where this came from and uh, and maybe it even makes the people who are kind of working with this think a little differently about the money that they are going to leave to others because I love that idea. I, yeah. I think I, I think honoring honoring the hard work and the the planning and preparation for a next generation that somebody did before and letting that be visible to the next generation. Oh, that's an awesome thing to do. Yeah. Good. Aunt Peggy paid for this vacation, guys. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Well, we of course the, these uh Million dollar IRAs. We've been encouraging young people to put uh, to do uh, grandparents to help with. Boy, there's so much that can be done, uh, and hopefully, you know, don't one, one yeah. last thing on this one, Paul. Yeah. If, if you're really trying to think about what the long term legacy is or what the long term investment horizon is, when you're talking about uh, asset allocation or asset classes, I'm not sure there's. I'm not sure I would put any of it or very little of it in fixed income because the, the horizon is so long. And then you need to think about the equity allocation. So you could do something like an, like an all value or an all US value um, or even a, even a four fund, which is tilted towards small and value and with a little bit smoother ride maybe. Um, just kind you of- You be shocked to find out, Daryl. I did recommend a four fund strategy. Oh. <laughs> it probably is better than the S and P five hundred. Probably. Probably. All right, guys. Let me let me uh, 
uh, continue here. Now, here's, here's an interesting question. We all get these questions. This one is titled Small Value Tilt, if you're looking at, the, at those written questions. But here's the bottom line. Here is an email where somebody says, I love your work. And uh, I've been listening to you for 15 years and I read your books and he's even written, read your book, Chris. Okay. So he's really listening to us. (laughs) Then he gives us the list of the things that he's doing with his money. And there's always, almost always a huge difference between what they've decided to do because it's different than what we recommend, but now they want us to bless it. And so What is interesting to me is I feel like I am in the middle of the 150 portfolios better than yours conversation because the way that he has put this portfolio together is it's fine. It's 10% REITs. It's got uh, about half in bonds and and I'm sorry, 20% in bonds, partly in tips, partly in the bond market. He's got 25% in the total stock market, U.S. We don't have that in ours, but it's, it's okay. 30% in small cap value, 10% in international small cap value, and 15% in the total market international portfolio. So it's fine. It's not what we have have done because the problem is there are thousands of potential solutions. I don't know if when you looked at that, you had a different idea or what you would tell them to change. Daryl, you're looking at it like you read it. Well, I read your question. Um, I was just starting to think about this one when it when it came time to I see. <laughs> come and sit down with you guys. Um, the thing that I found a little bit different, I guess, is that uh, he talk, he's 40 years old and he talks about decreasing his small value allocation and adding to the bond allocation 2% a year over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so Conservative. Sorry? I think that's conservative. Don't, don't. Yeah, I would too. At 40 years, I'm not even sure he's, he's, he's got uh, 10% in bonds. So at, at age 40, I'm not sure I would have 10% in bonds, um, but he does. And so um, I would almost think about, about leaving, leaving the bonds alone for another 10 years. And uh, if, if you want to try to, if this, is this in a retirement account? I don't recall. Uh, I, 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 he doesn't say. No, it doesn't say. Yeah. Well, here's um, here, here's what I'm going to suggest, Daryl. Let's hold this conversation for an upcoming podcast where we talk about the glide path that people should have, because I think that's where you're going. Yeah. Because I can hear your glide path is going to be very different from mine, and then Chris is going to weigh in and be different. So let's make that a whole podcast where we fight about the glide path, okay? <laughs> Don't fight yes. too long. If you're gliding, you'll crash. Oh, no. you know, that's your Boeing I, background, right? The okay. thing I really like about his message is yeah. that it's, it's clear he's put some thought into not just what his allocation should be. He's put thought into the U.S. versus international, how much to tilt to small, how much risk to take now, how much risk to take later. And if it's a strategy and it's broadly diversified, you know, it might not be diversified exactly the same way we do, but it's broadly diversified. It has exposure to these factors that are going to give him meaningful improvements in the return per unit of risk he gets. It's got a lot of good things going for it. If it's the one he'll stick with, it's perfect. Yeah. You know, and and I, I, yeah, that that to me is uh, you've said it before, Paul. We're all on a on a uh, an exploration or a journey to try and find our own ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And so I, I think that that's the real test. Is you know, is it the one? Does he really have confidence in it, and can he stick with it? If so, awesome. <laughs> it's like stop the conversation and just let him run. 
Yeah, his question actually was, do you think it's reasonable or see anything stupid crazy? And the answer is, yeah, it's reasonable. Yeah. It's not yeah, crazy. Exactly. Not stupid. By, by the way, if you look at those tables that you've been producing for this upcoming presentation at that White Coat Investor Conference, this would be one of the better producing strategies. Right. Yeah, this is another one of those 150 that's better than yours. So yeah, it's right. not a bad portfolio. And it's what better than most of the 150. Speaking it around the edges. Yeah. Exactly. But if you okay, can here's a go ahead. You want to add something, Daryl? Nope. Just just oh. agreeing with Chris again, as usual. If you can live with it, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, this was a question of, of, about the flexible distribution tables that we produce. And what this person was asking was, did we ever, did we ever actually come up with a calculator that would allow people to put their own contributions uh, into the, the calculator and choose a different strategy, et cetera? And the answer is, yes, we did. Where's and, Craig? Well, <laughs> where is Craig when we need him? But, uh, Craig Apple developed that calculator for us. It is on our website on the home page at paulmerriman.com. You will see the lifetime investment calculator, and uh, we it has had phenomenal uh, reviews. I'm 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 thrilled actually. Uh, and then we have a question here, uh, and this one. God, how often do we get this? Basically, I'm sitting on cash. I'm sitting on a lot of cash and I want to get in the market. And I know just as soon as I get in the market, the market's going to head south. So it's a market timing decision. Is that what it is, gentlemen? And so I think what so. Would... I mean, Warren Buffett's sitting on a lot of cash. And if you're as smart as Warren Buffett, maybe you'll know exactly when to do something with it, but I'm not. Um, you know, so uh, I, I have made that mistake. I've sat on the sidelines with money when I was waiting for the market to go down so I could get back in, not all of my money, but a, but a chunk of change and, uh, you know, something that was pretty substantial. And in the end, I just put it all in later at a higher price. So uh, I, I think dollar cost averaging in if you're stuck is always a good starting point. You know, at least that gets Over you off period the time. Of time. Uh, you know, you can pick, but, uh, you know, you could, you could do 10% per month over 10 months. Um, I think that'd be a reasonable starting point. Um, but if that's too fast for you, you know, do it a little slower. If it's too slow for you, do it a little faster, but yeah. And if by chance, what's if that? By chance, if by chance during that period of time, your dollar cost averaging and the market drops 30 or 40%, would you be tempted to go ahead and put the rest in? I'm sure I'd be tempted. <laughs> you know, I mean, the thing about behavioral finance is that none of us are immune to all of these biases. I think we all we all have them, whether we admit it or not. Yeah. yeah. Any anything to add to that, Daryl? Well, as I recall, his question, he was concerned about the market. He says, he says, uh, I I know the market is overvalued, and my thought was. You know it's over. How do you know that? I don't know that. Do you personally know that, or do you only believe that because somebody's told you that? And so, so my question, where I ended up coming down, is exactly where Chris was. If you're concerned about it, not being able to put it all in at once, then DCA it in. And if the market continues up, at least you bought on the cheap on the front end. If it goes down, you bought on the cheap on the back end. So. If, you, if that makes you able to get off the dime, so to speak, and move and put it in, put it in, then do what you need to do. And what I used to tell uh, clients when I was in the business is that I don't care what uh, strategy you use to get in. When you finish getting in, whether it's this week or three years from now, you're still at the risk of the market heading south when you finally get in. And that what each and every one of us should, my personal belief, is have an amount of money that represents or amount of loss that represents the most loss that we want to accept regardless of when we get in. 
because if somebody says, I don't want to lose more than 25%, then they should not have more than half of their money in stocks. I don't care whether it goes in all at one time or in slowly. That should be their defensive posture if they want to defend against limiting that loss to that 25%. So that used to be my line when I was dealing with those problems. Hey, Chris, I like this one for you because you looked at all those ETFs and this person wants to know about leveraged ETFs. And uh, do you look at those as possible uh, ETFs to put into the portfolio? I generally don't. And I, you know, I, I, I've had a couple of questions about leveraged ETFs this last year. Uh, one was a leveraged small cap value ETF, and the other one was a, le a leveraged um, S&P 500 ETF in combination with uh, short-term bonds. So the bonds were leveraged, the stocks were not. Uh, and they, they do provide some interesting performance benefits. They typically come with higher costs. They don't fit our stereotypical description of the asset classes that make up our portfolios. So I haven't analyzed them in great depth because I'm usually looking for the best funds for the portfolio designs that we're, we're encouraging people to use. But I am going to look at them a little bit more and uh, try and develop some opinion about whether they would be a, a prudent alternative. Uh, so I, it's, it's kind of a, a newer area that's come up just recently and generated interest. I don't, I'd, I'd love to have your thoughts, yours and Daryl's on this too. Um, any thoughts, if you have any yet, or if it's just something that we need to look at. I do. Daryl, do you want to weigh in at I all? Have, I have no thoughts on it at all, other than I'm, I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. Good. Well, I've been around leveraged mutual funds for what, 30 plus years and, and actually using margin in the ownership of mutual funds, not buying an ETF that's leveraged and every day is leveraged up again uh, to whatever that market is. But that's very different than leveraging a $10,000 investment and, and you borrow 10 and then you don't borrow anymore. But people who in essence, continue to borrow as it goes up because it continues to leverage. Also, the bad times when you're going down, it continues. I mean, it 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 will eat away, and there is no. I mean, people say, "God, if I could just market time using these leveraged ETFs," and a few people will will make money and maybe make a lot of money. But I can tell you the professionals who have been tracked trying to trade these leveraged ETFs do not, from what I know, by the way, and somebody I'm sure will straight, straighten me out on this, uh, the people don't make money very often doing that. And what we're looking for are strategies that are built with high probability of success, not low. So uh, it's a much more dangerous position than uh, than a lot of people know in terms of what can happen to the downside. So well, there's certainly more cost. And I think one of the things that uh, intrigues people about some of the funds they've come to me about is their recent performance. And when I say recent, I mean, maybe two or three years of performance. Well, our market for the last two or three years has been mostly a a bullish market. Uh, we haven't been through a really tough downturn or one that lasted a long time. And so uh, I think that's, that's where some of my skepticism comes in is that there isn't a longer history to look at. But uh, it sounds like you have a longer history. And I really value that perspective. Well, I can give you some numbers that we should think through. And that is from 2000 through 2002, the triple Q. I mean, that leverage two times or three times, which you can, uh, it went down 80%. Now, what happens? I mean, you, you just basically lost all of your money. You have pennies left. I mean, literally pennies left uh, after having taken all that risk. And so 
that is not investing, by the way. Investing, by some people's definition, versus speculating, versus gambling. It's not gambling, because gambling, you find out right now whether you're a big winner or a big loser. But speculating, you know, if you, if you can expect to do well over 10 years and make money, high probability, that starts to sound like investing. If there's a high probability you're going to get, you're, you're going to crap out, that uh, is, is not an investment. That tends to be a speculation, which, by the way, I am sure that most experts would say that about Bitcoin. It's not that it's a bad thing. It's just not a high probability success thing. It's for people who are willing to lose most of their money. And that might or might not happen. We never know. Have either one of you ever taken a high flyer? I mean, a really high flyer. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, the employee stock purchase plans in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, uh, that, that would be my high flyer experience, you know, getting, getting extended positions in a high tech company because you get paid, you get, you'd be a fool not to participate in the program because you get a uh, substantial discount to buying the stock. And then there's a question of whether you sell right when you can at, you know, at the initial point or whether you hang on to it. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's where for us, the biggest risk or, you know, most volatile part of our portfolio has come from. And it's usually, uh, it's usually been because of uh, trying to be tax efficient that it gets to be a problem. Um, but it's a good problem to have. So, so, you know, so have you done it more than once, Chris? Yeah, I, when I was my first high tech company that I was at, I remember sitting across the desk from my my manager when our stock hit a new all time high, and him saying, "Yeah, I think it's a good time to divest. I think I'd sell some." And I remember telling him, "I'm just a buy and hold investor, no problem. I mean, I don't know anything about whether the market's going up or down." and I, I think within a couple of years, it was worth about 10% of what it was that day. Um, now, I just looked the other day, that stock, if we had just held on to it and never sold it today, so this is almost 13, 14 years later, something like that, or 2001, 20 years later, call it 20 years later, um, it's worth about the same amount as when we had that conversation across the table. So it came back eventually. Still there. That's good. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, for inflation. Yeah, and then the second time at my second high tech employer, I, but with we did something very different the second time around. We effectively got our money out. So we took uh, over a few years we sold enough that we had gotten a good return out of all of the money that we had put into it and then we chose to be tax efficient in how we divested the rest so that every year we sell some and over time you know that'll become a smaller and smaller part of the portfolio so uh, it's it's a really tricky decision because uh, there aren't many, you know, the academics will tell you, you get the same expected return from a basket of similar stocks as you do from that concentrated single stock. Mm -hmm. But the day that you sell, you're going to owe the federal government, and in my case, a charity as well, so that you reduce your holdings by 20 to 40 percent. So that's so the day that you make that change, it's almost like you're switching from one mutual fund that's no load into a load mutual fund where uh -huh. you lose 20 to 40 percent that right. day. Right. So you don't necessarily want to do that all at once. You know, yeah. it, it requires some thought. Yeah. Good for you, Daryl. You're an engineer. I don't for think how I've many years at Boeing? How long did you work at Boeing? Too many. <laughs> uh, actually, actually, I worked just the right amount, but the last few were not fun. Um, well, that's not true either, but uh, I, I guess I worked in the aerospace industry for about 37 years. So now, do you and think almost you all of it, almost all of it was fun. So 
And do you think that people in that industry that not a similar high-tech industry like Chris was in, you think people there did less speculating because they're in an environment that is, uh, is less speculative? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Huh? I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any comparison because I've never been in an environment like Chris, is, mm -hmm. Chris was in. So I can't really compare them. Um, I do know that there were, uh, I did have, have friends who were also engineers who were trying to time the market and, 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 uh, <laughs> I do remember a lot of them freaking out in late October of 1987. And, yeah. Yeah. uh, they were not, they were not happy campers. I, I didn't worry too much about it. Um, I don't know if I was just stupid or believed what I was doing and believed in what I was doing or was just unaware of what was really happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wrote it out and done okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, but I, I don't think I've ever done anything with, with leverage like Chris was taught. I've done some stupid things, but I don't, I don't think I've ever done anything uh, or had an opportunity to do anything uh, like that. Uh, like Chris was talking about, though. Well, I, I know that we've had a long session today. I can't tell. Uh, how, I don't have any idea how long it's been. Chris, can you tell? Are we going on 45 minutes? Probably about that. Well, I just want to ever so briefly, uh, I, I, I want to thank the folks who have donated to our foundation. Yes. We had some challenges in getting set up properly with some of these organizations that clear uh, through major corporations, clear through them like Benevity, uh, which I think Google uses as the place that people do this. I just, I just want to say to the people who continue to push me, thank you, we got it done. And, uh, uh, and it's purely my fault that it didn't get done sooner. But um, unless you guys uh, have something more that you, on your mind that you want to bring to the, for the good of the order, I appreciate your time. Are you worried about this being a market top right in here now with the market up and, and, and feeling like it doesn't want to go any higher every time it bumps up here, it starts to go back down? Are you starting to get that feeling like it's going to? Finally, every, time, really go every down. time I get that feeling, I think of your expression. There's always the good news in column A and the bad news in column B. And it, it, it brings me comfort because yeah. I figured the market, based on the wisdom of the crowd, is fairly priced. And, uh, you know, when I first retired many years ago, there were all kinds of people saying the market was overpriced and it would never go up. And it's gone up a lot since then. So, uh, you know, that old, uh, John Maynard Keynes quote of the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent always comes to mind too. You yep. just can't time it. You can't figure out when it's going to do what it's going to do. So you're better off just, just go with the ride. Yeah. I, I think, you know, go ahead, Dale. One of the things that, that I have found to be the most useful thing that I've done in, in respect to being with respect to being able to, to tolerate the ups and downs and, and remain rational longer than the market can remain irrational is, is to have probably 20, 20 years ago or more, I started keeping track of what my portfolio value was every week. I just looked at it, it was mechanical. I didn't care whether it went up or went down, but I recorded it. And I've gone back and I've looked at that last 20 years of history and it goes like this, but it goes like this. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see these ups and downs and everything else, and when you when you look back on it with the benefit of of hindsight of decades, 20, 20 years, and you look at it and you see those, oh yeah, I remember that. That was really scary. It's only this big, you know. Yeah. And and so I think that that there's benefit for people to keep their own history so that as that history gets longer, they can look back at the history they've lived through. And they can see that, oh yes, these things happen. And so far, it has not been fatal or even, or even necessarily truly painful if they haven't, if they haven't capitulated. So 
um, I think that's a worthwhile thing to remember and to try to do. It, it's been very useful for me and my wife. And can oh, okay. I, can I, uh, I want to mention something that you do, Daryl, for our readers that I think is very powerful. Uh, you created these uh, tables. Uh, first, we have the fine tuning tables, but they then le lead to other tables. And one of that set, one of those sets is about the accumulation period where you start with nothing and you put in $83.33 a month. And then you raise the next year, I think 3%. Stop me if I'm wrong on this. And you look at all the different strategies that we use. And not only do you look, for example, at the all value or the all small cap or the four fund US or whatever that equity position is, you then show it also with 90% in bonds, 80% in bonds, 70, 60, 50, so that you see the combination of these equity asset classes and the bonds. And if somebody can't find a comfortable place to be on those tables, they, they need to drop me an email and a phone number and let's talk because there is somewhere on those tables a comfortable place for people to be. I think they are powerful because people who, who haven't kept track somebody's keeping track for them in a sense. That's what you've done with those tables is keep track and show people what that trip has been like. And all those bumps and those increases, they're all in there. And so that may be for young people, what they should look at is what other people went through because that part is real. Yeah. And thank yeah. you, Daryl. And thank you, Chris, as always. And thank you, our, our viewers and our listeners. And uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, we're excited about the update that Chris is going to be coming out in the coming months. Is it months, Chris? Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I'm waiting on a little bit of data. I want to work off uh, you know, the best data I can. And some of that won't be available until February. So it'll probably be February or March before I update the best in class. But you know, hopefully that's not keeping anybody stuck. You know, The difference in fund performance is minor. The important thing is getting your asset allocation right. So yep. you should be yep. able to move ahead. Yeah, that's great. And Daryl, thanks for all you're doing on getting those tables together. Uh, you, you both are star performers. Thank you very much and take care. So we'll wing it. We'll have fun, I hope. And, and uh, did you, you cut your beard? I did. I couldn't take it anymore. Oh. <laughs> Well, well start to look like some guy from ZZ Top, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You needed an axe. <laughs> exactly. All right. Maybe I should get an axe in there, yeah. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com, and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.